Inside Crime Liberty Show with me, Swim Dobson, and him, Tim Patton. Today we're joined by Rick Story to discuss, does grammar exist? Tim. There's a lot of subtopics, there's a lot of subheadings we could describe this topic, like is Bill Clinton right about grammar? Um, you know, are the grammar Nazis correct about anything here? So this is a peripheral topic which has haunted me for some time, since grade school for that matter. If I could go back in time to harass some of my school teachers, I would ask them, why are sentences ordered that way and not this way? So you could start with a simple example before we talk, go, get more abstract here. It's like the cat eating fish. The cat eats fish. And you can, I think you can come up with at least six to ten effective. Well, if you add the word usually and a date, the cat usually eats fish on Saturday. You, you now you have like six words here. And you can come up with at least ten sentences here of ways to order, which are basically grammatically correct without betraying the picture meaning of the word. So if you read Wittgenstein's Philosophical Investigations, who he takes from the picture theory of language, which he takes from Augustine, Augustine's Confessions, he has this picture theory of language, basically says you just have a picture of a cat eating a fish, all right? So it's just sort of like logical in that regard. You know, it, it, it's you know, eating is just consuming some calories, and then the cat, four-legged animal of some variety, um, and, and the fish, something that swims. Now, if you switch the words cat and fish around, then suddenly this sentence makes grammatically correct, but it's not logically the same meaning. So it betrays the logical meaning. And at this level, grammar is sort of interesting because it's just sort of like simple applied logic. Right? We're just sort of describing actions here. Um, um, and you could add times, but times are more difficult to show here. So I basically view on these simple things that grammar works. It sort of intuitively works insofar as it's a social convention. Now, one of the things is, why couldn't you organize them other ways? Uh, uh, why couldn't you organize other ways? And then time, time is another thing that sort of bothers me about uh, writing gra grammatically as well. And this came up with Bill Clinton, you know. They, you know, it depends on the meaning of the word is. Is it is it for all times or it's just, you know, that happens that day that you had sexual relations. So so the time also poses another problem here with grammar. And I think Wittgenstein even sort of states that in philosophical investigations that like should statements are sort of weird to make uh, insofar as you like. Like, you know, the cat should be eating fish. How would you show that with a picture like that? That's that's not that's not easily that's easily done. You could just state such and such is the case. So I do agree that grammar is useful. Um, and I do agree. We, I, I'm using it to communicate. Uh, uh, so you could shout performative contradiction. You're using grammar. You know, you should just stop talking here. But. I think there are edge cases like, you know, is sleep an active word? You know, like, is sleep an active word while you're resting? You know, there's lots of edge cases of grammar. But as far as, like, you know, writing papers, this is another thing that bothered me in college here. You have these sort of uh, – Jordan Peterson and R.C. Sprawl, two people pointing this out. Like you have these sort of somewhat left-wing professors who are somewhat Marxist, somewhat postmodern. I know they're somewhat, Thaddeus Rush would say they're in conflict, and I agree, but they sort of view grammar as a social convention, but they still mark papers based on grammar and style. It's like 20% of your grade. And it's like, that, that, that's always sort of made me chuckle here, because like, what exactly are they grading on? So, so Rick, you have some number of thoughts here. I sort of opened this up with like uh, my picture theory. Wittgenstein's a big name in linguistics from my understanding. I think he takes it from Augustine. Um, what do you make of this? Do you think grammar exists? I, I, I do agree that it exists in the sense that we, like, if you say the words in just any order, they're unintelligible. Um, but there seems to be a curve where sentences are intelligible enough. Um, and then the difference between better and slightly less better seems to be a very minute detail and they seem to differ on time and place you know if you go back in time and this goes this, this just shows up in the second amendment date people like jefferson and a lot of historical writings had really crazy comma usage here um some people say the second amendment's invalid because of the comma you stick the commas in wrong places you know comma theory could change so to speak over time 
So, Rick, just starting up, what do you make of grammar? What do you make of my ramblings on grammar here? Do you think grammar exists on a deeper level or is it just merely like a convention here? Rick? I mean, I'd agree with so much of what you said, Tim. I mean, for me, uh, in terms of, does grammar exist? Uh, uh, for me, that it's a little bit like saying, does music exist? Um, now, uh, bear with me. Um, I mean, that might seem like it's it's way too broad, but um, you know, let me try and explain what I mean. Um, with music, of course, you're, I mean, r- really, you're trying to express something, and um, you know, I mean, we we would assume that you know that would be for others' benefit. That there's going to be some kind of shared aspect, some sort of cooperative aspect here. So you know, there is going to be an audience. There will be a listener. Potential. I mean, of course, yeah, yeah, I mean, you can play music on your own and simply enjoy it by yourself, you know, as you might, you know, read a poem uh, by yourself or create a poem by yourself. Um, but, OK, t- typically with, with music, you're you're trying to express something. Now, there are going to be some rules to that music um people are going to be able to determine and bear in mind this is going to be across uh, cultures as well that um okay that that sounded discordant you know those two notes were way too close together and um you know there's just something in one's brain where um the two sounds coming together uh, the brain simply finds it difficult to distinguish them and it, it just makes you feel uncomfortable. Uh, so, you know, a sound can be discordant. On the other hand, there can be things that are harmonious. Um, you can be sort of making a point with music and the other person can kind of get what you're talking about. So you could have a little refrain. Um, and, you know, sometimes in films when you want someone to sort of be, oh, expecting what's going to happen next. You might sort of stop at a note and you don't quite finish that last note that the audience is expecting. And, and then there's a sense of expectation as you're waiting, what's going to happen next? Um, all of those feelings can be created by music. And um, there's just something innate about people that, you know, will feel something about the music, get a sense of something there. And it's kind of the same with grammar. Um, You know, I'm a writer and, uh, you know, at at times I've thought to myself, okay, I'll try and, you know, read something, try and improve my writing. And, you know, really the the bottom line is when you look at all these books about how to become a better writer is, they'll say, you know, writing language, really, communication is just a lot like music. You know, you're, you're reading the sentences. Do they flow? If you're going to make a longer sentence, um, you know, is there a reason you're making it? Is it apparent to the audience why there's a longer sentence? I mean, you have a shorter sentence, something abrupt. Um, you know, with, with with the music of language, you are communicating something to the person. There's also something that they're feeling and they're kind of intuiting, but it just sounds right. And grammar is a lot like that. Um, And I mean, okay, um, you might say in music, sometimes, yeah, there are rules, but sometimes you might break one of those rules and it's on purpose. You're making a point by breaking that rule. Um, And, you know, I mean, there, there are like universal rules to human communication, you know, language use that we can identify. You know, typically when people are engaging in language, I mean, you don't need some kind of third party um, to come in and intervene and make sure you're obeying the rules. That like You don't need the state to come and intervene with a language. People just, uh, as they're engaging in, in you know, linguistic discourse, they just assume, OK, this person's probably not going to go on for too long and bore me to death, especially if we've only just met. You know, um, they're probably going to be attempting to tell the truth here. Of course, you can break that rule as well, right? If you're telling a joke, you know, you're not <laughs> you're not necessarily telling the truth. But I will deliberately somehow let you understand that I'm not here to tell the truth. I'm going to be telling a joke right now. Or, you know, I'm, I'm making some kind of 
point. I'm making some kind of sarcastic point, um, a rhetorical point, perhaps. Um, you know, there's another rule, which is, you know, relevance. It's, it's, it's going to be relevant to you. I'm not going to just start babbling on about something completely unrelated to the topic at hand. Um, and I'm kind and I'm going to make an attempt at least to make it as clear for you as I possibly can, you know, given how well I might be able to use that language, yeah, even, even how tired I am. It's not necessarily it's a foreign language. Uh, you know, I might just not be at my best. Um, but there are just general rules to language that we tend to follow. Um, and yeah, I mean, OK, like with music, I might break some of those on purpose. And there are going to be more formal uh, forms of communication, such as when I give a, p a particular public speech or I'm I'm giving a testimony and this is a serious business. You know, people, there's a lot at stake here. Maybe not for me, maybe for someone else, but, you know, this is a costly matter. Or there might be more informal language, you know, and so it becomes a bit more like jazz, you know, and I'm sort of, if this is playtime, we're just sort of playing and, um, uh, you know, that can be written communication where we text and we use like in more informal forms of writing. It doesn't necessarily matter if the punctuation isn't quite right or, you know, I make some typos. It's not the end of the world. Um, but it's like that with informal language as well. You know, I think the discussion we're having right now is a, you know, it's a little bit more informal. You know, we're friends and, uh, you know, we're trying to make things clear. We're trying to make a, a, a point for the audience, bearing them in mind. Um, but, um, you know, there's not a lot at stake here. You know, I can, um, uh, well, you know, I just said, you know, at the end of the sentence just there. Um, these little colloquialisms, these little uh, playing around with the words, um, we can allow for something like that. Um, and I think that's what grammar is as well, you know, narrowing it down to the subject of grammar in particular within language, as opposed to something like, you know, vocabulary. Um, if we look at grammar, we can play around with the grammar as well. OK, yes, there are, there are rules. OK, but sometimes I might want to fiddle around with those rules in order to make a point. Um, I think you were talking before, Tim, about the cat eating the fish on Saturday. You know, so if I start the sentence with, on Saturday, the cat eats the fish, um, uh, given a particular context, there might be a reason why I'm starting with on Saturday and I'm emphasising it with the intonation in my voice. Um, so, like, given the placing of um on saturday within the sentence i'm 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 wanting to draw your attention to it i'm also trying to do draw your attention to it with the intonation um you know within that sentence in that particular context the fish might not be so important um you know but i, I might um you know if i said no 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 the cat eats fish on a saturday um, you know, I, I might, I'm trying to draw your attention, obviously, to the cat. The fact that it's on Saturday is less important because you've already assumed it. Um, so, you know, we can play around with the grammar there as well. We can even, you know, change the subject of the sentence. Um, I mean, with this sentence, I mean, it just sounds weird, right? If I say the fish is eaten by the cat on Saturday, you know, I'm trying to make the fish the subject. Uh, even though it's the thing that's been eaten. But how many contexts would that make things clearer for you? Um, probably not very many. And you see, that's kind of what it's about. It, language is is um, can be very context specific. And grammar is something that helps us to um, make things context specific and also across time. So across time and space, I'm able to draw your attention to and make clear um, exactly what it is that I've got in mind. Um, and I mean, that's that's what grammar's about, really. Um, so I, I, I'm, I'm wondering how you guys are feeling about my um, uh, comparison here with music. So uh, music music is interesting as a as a reference point insofar as 
you if you were to sit yourself in a room you couldn't just sort of a priori work out what good music would be you'd actually have to experiment and see what worked uh, this is why for instance lots of the modernist sort of surrealist and uh, sort of uh, serialist stuff which is um you could consider very sort of a priori music we must all we have this abstract rule that we should play all notes should have an equal number of plays because that's the good egalitarian thing to do uh, that produces very bad music so i think that's an interesting uh, reference point um and how you construct things i think i think rick is right is context dependent although i think there are things which i think as rick pointed out there are going to be things which are almost universal contexts in a sense well maybe not universal but very general in that um as rick was saying you wouldn't necessarily say oh the fish uh, the fish was eaten by the cat. Uh, you would tend to do it the other way around. Um, so when in preparation for this, uh, Tim put the sentence with the cat and the fish, it seems to me to make the most sense that you start with a noun, something that's the, something that exists, and then it then does something. So the cat usually eats fish. Um, and then on Saturday, probably just sounds better. At the beginning, I mean, I can't really make a hard and fast case for where on Saturday should go, although I think it kind of feels more right. Say on Saturday, the cat usually eats the fish, but the cat normally does an action, and the now normally does something. It seems to reflect better what happens in reality. There are things, and those things do things, uh, but it wasn't the thing to begin with. It couldn't do anything. So in a kind of makes that um, that I think makes sense in. Now, I say you could be making a point to invert it. That's certainly true. I think an interesting thing related to lang uh, to grammar uh, here, which may or may take us slightly off topic. So go here if you wish. If, if you don't, then don't. Um, is to what extent is uh, language um, a vehicle for thought or does it merely represent it? Um, because if you take the view that uh, language is only a vehicle is the only vehicle for genuine thought then you have an interesting problem of um of kind of a, you have to kind of hold a stronger view of grammar uh as being sort of universalizable and you and sort of universalized otherwise um it would i'm not sure how you could get ordered thought otherwise whereas if you were to make the take the view that uh language can be a vehicle for thought but there's also sort of genuine thought that is only then represented by language afterwards you get a more um you could get a more sort of flexible view of how grammar operates um so those would be sort of my, my opening thoughts on the topic and the responses so far <coughs> I started with I started with those six or seven sentences, that simple picture there, because I wanted to start with a tangible example rather than starting with with, with um, theory here. And kudos to you, for Swithin, for making a rule here. But the sort of inner closeted autist in me always has troubles with tendencies and rules, um, especially rules that get broken and so forth. You know, it's sort of like it's sort of like tipping at a restaurant in the United States. It's like what exactly? You know, is the answer. You know, there is no answer. Uh, it's 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 just a tendency. And I, and and to me, the sounds right thing. Like I can I can I can if I say a sentence in my head enough, I can sound it out correct. It, uh, it to me, it sounds fine. I know the meaning of it. It sounds fine. This this is where Wicken this Wickenstein's point about there no such thing as a private language is somewhat I think interesting because its language is communicative. So like, you know, I, there's town or city names. There's a local city name, which uh, I, I which is a, it's, it's, it's an Indian Dutch word. It's a the Dutch Indian word. It's like the, the Dutchization of an Indian word. Um, and I, I've always mispronounced it. And I've gotten my family to more or less mispronounce it, too, because I, I read it before I saw it. Uh, and actually, uh, there's a lot of words I'll I'll read before I ever hear, hear anyone pronounce them. Uh, and if I hear it incorrectly the first time, it's going to be very hard for me to relearn the quote unquote unquote correct 
uh, version of how you say it um, here. So, so, so in that way, the pronunciation is a lot like grammar here. When people say, it's, well, this one sounds better. Well, I, you know, that, that it may sound better for you, um, um, which, which, you know, this, this comes more of an epistemology point here where it's like, well, some people like this music, some people like that music. Maybe we can say there's such thing as bad grammar. Okay, maybe we can go full Thomas Aquinas here and go via negativia here and go, well, these sentences are incorrect, but you can't decipher which sentences are the better ones. I, I, that might be that might be doable. You know, you could just you could just, you know, within reason, you could X out certain sentences. And again, certain per permutations of the words don't make any sense here uh, uh, or intelligible here. And your point about thought and grammar is interesting here. Like, do you think first and then you use grammar or is it the other way around? Grammar is the only is a way in which we order our thought. That That's a pickle here, which which I've I've never been able to resolve here. Like, I, I I, like, I've never managed to learn another language here. And I've tr a few years ago, I tried very hard to learn French. because It's a fairly useful language for North Africa. Um, and I tried to learn it, but I, I just could not I could not get past it uh, for whatever reason here. Um, um, so 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 the foreign language things always mystifies me. I think it's partly because my L1 language mystifies me to some extent as well. So when people talk about grammar here I've always well there's a lot of tendencies and sounds right but you know I, I think I've just learned through sheer rote uh, uh, imitation here which poses problems here because if you certain writers write poorly I think both of you would admit that so if you read them and they write poorly you copy their habits here like <laughs> so so you end up with all these uh, 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 things here. So Rick, I've been rambling on. You've heard Swithin's comments here. Do you have anything further to add here with respect to, you know, Swithin's question about? I have some prepared questions, but the Swithin's question is fairly interesting to me as well. So what do you make of that, Rick? Well, I, I, I want to bring in the thought of a linguist whose name is uh, George uh, Lakoff. Um, because I mean, he, um, I, I think he's fascinating. He, and I, I believe he's right. Uh, he, he will say the reason why you will see, and, and again, Swivum was right to say not universally, but you know, what we can see generally is that with metaphors that uh, people will use across cultures around the world, um, people will tend to do similar things. So when they're talking about a person who is very kind, very amicable, uh, generous, that sort of thing, they'll describe them as being warm. Now, why might they do that? Why is there that association, which seems to just be automatic, it's just felt and automatic, that someone who is kind and, and lovely, they are warm? Um, and it will it will tend to be because, OK, those people who you are closer to and have that kind of relationship with. And of course, you know, primordially speaking, that would have been with your mother, uh, typically um, you're, you're physically closer to them. You're making skin contact. You are sharing warmth and you feel warmer. And what's going on in your body in terms of your heart rate and in terms of where the blood is going in your body, it does make you you have a warm feeling. And so it's, there's something intuitive then about describing that person as warm. But it's just one of countless examples. We simply don't have the time to go through them all. But um, his point is basically being embodied, being, you know, simply what we are, these embodied beings, you know, upright, our two hands out in front of us. Um, our metaphors just seem to be what makes the most sense in terms of the way our bodies tend to operate in an everyday sense. Um, when we talk about things being higher than other things and things like that, we just tend to know what that will be referring to. And we assume other people will, even across cultures, we might make assumptions about people understanding our metaphors. Um, now, why am I going on about this? Because it, there's something about that in grammar as well. Swiven agreed with me. OK, you, you might not say 
the fish is eaten by the cat. Why not? Why might that not intuitively be the most apparent thing for one to do to make the object um, of the situation? because the fish is lying there as an object to be utilised by the cat, why might it not make the most sense to make the object the, at the start of the sentence, use it as a subject? Um, well, I mean, because we, as embodied beings, you know, we start off with the I am doing something. We have, we have a central uh, locus um, being our embodied selves from which other things are occurring. And so, you know, we, we see the cat and it's active and we see it eating the fish and we kind of relate to it the most in that situation, eating the fish. Maybe we want to eat the fish as well. And so we're just relating to it most in that moment. And it feels right to make it the subject of that sentence. Possibly. Right. Um so, I mean, there, there's some, OK, right, there's something general, OK, about the way we might see people using grammar. Um, is it universalizable? Well, uh, I mean, only in so far as, you know, we're talking about other human beings like us, you know, physically like us, uh, you know, brain is in the same place and everything, uh, tend to have the same bodily habits and, uh, you know, a lot of the same everyday activities and you know physical perspectives on how things work in this world what it's like to uh, continue to exist and survive in this world uh, to love laugh play cry etc um and so yeah i mean that, that those would be my thoughts on in terms of how generalizable are uh, can grammar be um and I mean, I think I'm touching upon some of the points you you raised there, Tim. I mean, you you were you were saying, um, uh, you know, there's no such thing as a private uh, language. You know, you brought up that point by Wittgenstein there, and and you know, you you admitted, you know, that that can um, rub your uh, libertarian uh, sentiments the wrong way. Um, I just use a metaphor there, which only makes sense if you have, uh, as an embodied being, felt being rubbed the wrong way. That's interesting. Um, so, OK, this, this idea of is, is there such thing as a private language? Well, I mean, again, no, um, there isn't. I um, mean, all of the instances uh, where humans have been encountered who have been starved of communication. I say starved. I mean that. Um, throughout their formative years, especially um, from infanthood up to the age of four, um, they are quite severely mentally retarded. Um, those parts of their brain uh, can never grow uh, to be, you know, what we would understand to be fully developed uh, normally. Um, and so, um, you know, it, it does seem that we, in order to function properly as humans, we need to be enculturated into a civic culture, um, by which I mean, you know, one which has all of these shared ideas and metaphors and everything. And of course, part and parcel of that, central to it all, is a shared language. So we need to have a language. And it has to be something shared. It has to be something shared um across what can i say uh, a community some kind of organic community at the very least a family um and um yeah without that uh, no you cannot have a private language you know after having acquired a language and after having you know a mind which has mastered that language across numerous interactions countless interactions perhaps um, you know, a mind full of metaphor, a mind full of experience. Um, can someone like Tolkien, for instance, just invent Elvish? Um, you know, OK, then you can have your own private language. You know, what use is it? I mean, you know, maybe a very fine language. Uh, there are lots of people who are mad about Elvish and they think it's uh, 
lovely and all the rest of it. Uh, so people who are crazy about Esperanto as well. Um, not catching on because um, it's not really organically uh, developing. Uh, and I, I, I think that is really what rubs your libertarian sentiments the wrong way, Tim. It's not because, because of course, I mean, it is a very libertarian thing in the sense that language is as decentralized as I've been saying. It's like music. It, it, you know, there's no state telling you what the rules are. But I think it's the fact that when you have these ideas, you have a metaphor. Yeah, you have, um, um, you know, a song, a shared folk story, perhaps. Um all of these things, all of the words, the vocabulary, all of it, um, it, it's something that's shared by a community. It's not something that is owned by an individual. Um, and it's not, it's not in a, in a strange sort of sense, it's something that is collectively owned by that group. Um, it's not something that an individual can necessarily change unless maybe he invents a funny word or he has an interesting play on words um like words that were you know just invented in a by a william tyndale ended up in the king james bible and then they they ended up you know working their way into the the common discourse uh, you know shakespeare did the same um you know people do come up with and somehow you know through some unpredictable organic process those things can end up catching on as we say um uh yeah and i mean you know grammar can change as well you know people didn't used to say oh i'm loving that that was grammatically incorrect to say i am loving you know present continuous tense you can only you can have the present you say i love this um you know, because it's something that you wouldn't expect to change over time. It's not something that's just occurring in the moment. But McDonald's, um, with a little, you know, Justin Timberlake uh, chime coming in, said, I'm loving it. Um, and now people say that all the time. Not just in America. I hear people say that here in England a lot. Um, so these things can change organically. And it is largely a communal process and I, I think ultimately that's what um um yeah might be a little a bit uncomfortable for you having more individualistic tendencies tim rick um you mentioned lakoff um with his views on grammar how does his views differ from say chomsky chomsky his early work as a linguist is known for his view of the uh, universal um what's it is universal theory of grammar or i can't remember exact Uni phrasing. universal grammar universal, universal grammar. grammar um in what respect would you say that chomsky is correct and to what extent what extent do you think he's wrong but firstly if you could just outline what chomsky's view is and then how that differs from say yours or lakoff's well i mean chomsky's interesting isn't he because so many people know him he's uh, i i believe i'm not mistaken he was identified well, he was voted one of the most identifiable academics amongst lay people um, of our time. Um, and yet, I mean, he has a lot to say about politics. He's a lot to say about things outside of his field, which is linguistics. Uh, but, but within linguistics, I'm afraid all of his theories have been disproven. Uh, I, I don't think there's much of lasting importance i mean other than of course prompting people to disprove his theories and you know thereby you know they have to do a lot of work it raises some interesting questions um but sadly uh, all of his theories have been disproven his most famous theory um is universal grammar now i mean it started off before that chomsky thought that um there's there's just some kind of language acquiring mechanism that goes on in the brain um which neuroscience will you know maybe maybe one day prove um 
and you know there's just like one thing there's like some part of the brain which is just it's just designed to acquire language specifically um and of course this got whittled down as it you know became apparent that that's just not how the brain works um and so you know whittled down to just okay there's some kind of universal grammar acquiring thing in the brain some innate ability with humans there designed to acquire grammar i mean sadly you know that's been disproven as well because well i mean you can go into jungles you know studies have been done you know you know in order to answer chomsky this has been done this has been studied very carefully you can go and find tribes off in the jungle somewhere and they have you know unfortunately low iqs um there isn't really going a lot going on upstairs with them that was another metaphor um and um, sadly you know they don't really have a very strong grasp of the past past tense or the future tense really um and in fact they're you know communicative abilities are quite poor you know they just more or less focus on whatever is in front of them at that particular moment and they're largely just sort of driven about by their appetites from one moment to the next and um you know so where is their you know universal grammar ability and so, so so just to, just to mm, clarify yeah what, go on. what what is the universal grammar ability that chomsky claims existed well, I mean, it's deliberately vague, Swithin. It's, it's, it's deliberately. So he doesn't that, say. He doesn't say. No, I mean, it's. I mean, he describes it as some sort of mechanism, which you know, it is to be proven or disproven by you know, as neuroscience understands the brain okay. more and more. But it's just not how it it works, Swithin. Um, you know. Well, I'm just thinking with the tribes. Can't you just claim yes. that? Well, the past and but well, past and future. Well, okay, well that's not universal. What the present is. Well, okay, again, I mean that's the thing. So then you have to start whittling down. Okay, well, what exactly is this particular um, unit? This particular item of grammar that can be universalizable. Um, and. Um, I, I believe he tried to hit upon something like it was the um, oh um, the past simple tense and the past continuous. Like I was just describing to you now, I love my wife. You know, I am loving this Big Mac. You know, um, I am doing this thing right now here in the moment. Or do I say? I do this as in it's a habit of mine across time. Um, but even then it was found that the tribe couldn't even really get to grips with that and didn't even really see the point in it. Um, so, you know, wh wh where is this universalizable grammar for them? Um, it seems to make a lot more sense when you understand that um, yeah, OK, there are different parts of the human brain which start to develop in a you know pretty much predictable way such that um, humans will begin discriminating certain sounds that they'll be hearing from their mother, particularly. Um, and so, for instance, there's a, a, a fantastic scholar called Patricia Cool. And she uh, was able to identify that uh, even up to the age of uh, two and between two and four, um, there's a part of the brain that was discriminating, not picking up the sounds, but um, dismissing sounds that were not of any particular importance. And so very particular sounds that the mother was making start to acquire more meaning and the brain starts to map more meaning around those sounds and starts to be able to identify them elsewhere whilst discriminating out sounds that are not particularly meaningful like a car sort of trundling along dis in the distance um, a tree sort of blowing in the wind 
that doesn't necessarily have any particular meaning, some communicated intent there. Um, and so this is why, for instance, even, you know, Asian, East Asian babies um, will start to not really be able to distinguish between L sounds and R sounds um, from their mother, because there isn't really much of a distinction between those two sounds in East Asian languages. And so, of course, as we all know, and you know, people make jokes about it as East Asians uh, grow and they try to learn, for instance, a European language, they can find it quite difficult to um, uh, produce that distinct U and R sound, those two dis different sounds, L and R, um, you know, it, it, obviously not for all of them, you know, some of them can just get it, you know, that, that part of their brain is still really quite strong. And perhaps they have a lot of motivation to learn the language and and, you know, they watch a lot of uh, Western shows or something like that. Um, uh, but, you know, it is notoriously difficult for them because of that mechanism, which dis which discriminates out sounds uh, in order to try and determine meaning. And it, and it is all about. Um, you know, different parts of the brain, which in humans just start developing and growing more as as the human uh, starts to have more social interaction and starts to be able to um, map meaning to different things and acquire, you know, uh, and, you know, metaphor, of course, is a large part of that. Um, it's a really vast subject. Um, I hope my little truncated version of all of that is is OK. But basically, um, you know, as embodied beings with these minds, which, um, um, you know, seem to grow as they start to acquire meaning and they start to be able to attribute uh, meaning to certain things. Yes, including sounds, especially sounds produced by other humans. Um, uh, you know, that, that is all a healthy natural normal process in human development and it doesn't necessarily mean that there has to be some thing or some part of the brain which uh you know uniquely gets something out of grammar like i said you know grammar is just like a helpful tool it's a part of language and language is a kind of music expressing meaning and and we can kind of break the rules of grammar sometimes, but it's just it's just a way of me helping to get across the thoughts in my head about certain actions and things taking place across time and space. Uh, there's something super special about grammar in particular. Does that make sense? I think so. So what you're saying is there's no specific part of grammar, just some sort of innate developmental ability as the brain or the human as a whole, which has langu language acquiring ability. Yeah. I mean, you know, language is just a thing that we do. I mean, I mean, do we here's a question. So do we necessarily need to have a spoken language? Does it necessarily have to be noises that are coming out of my mouth? Well, I mean, I suppose it not might, necessarily. If you just have, if you just have entirely written or a sign language, for indeed, example, exactly, and, exactly, and you could yeah. probably get seventy-five per. I, I don't know if you ever saw the movie Quiet Place, but that's yeah. sort of an uh, analogy of of a of a non vocal. Of course, you have deaf, yes. like deaf people. They clearly, they're clearly not stupid internally, and I think, I think, I think they have developed like ways that they can. I think I, that that time period might be in the past now because I think they have ear implants now, so they sort of can hear some extent mm. here. But your your comments yes. about sound, the sound interpretation thing, that that to me, because words are just like what's the difference between ah uh, ooh, 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 or something like that, and you know mm -hmm. the cat, like you sort of cut, yes. like so that that you know as someone, so you start with cut at cat or like. Ch Ick in chicken. Yeah. Uh, you can sort of vary your pronunciations up to a point, and the words still intelligible. But yes. it's sort of like a, it's sort of like, it's like a sort of like a target where you, you, you at some point, um, 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 and this is this is this is something that I've 
firsthand have experience with as being raised on speech therapy. It's probably something in my family here because some of my other mm. relatives have it too. Right. Which makes language which makes language extremely artificial for me in a way because I used to have a quote unquote private language and some of my nieces and nephews probably do too as well. Um, um, and that's just speech pronunciation problems. You start with letters and you, you get you start with sounds, you make words out of them. Some some words are only one sound, like uh, for example. Uh, some words have like eight syllables in there, you know, and German, yeah. for example, yeah. is famous for having like paragraph length words, uh, uh, <laughs> just compound words. Yeah. Um, uh, so so the sound interpretation mechanism, like, w- is this something that human is this something that unique to humans here? Like, what what does this come from here? Well, that, that's uh, that's the, that to me is the part of the meat of the issue here to use another army of metaphors <laughs> i don't think communication i don't think communication is something unique to humans um and i love the fact that you've brought up sign language because when i speak a word i am making something physical i'm making a sound it's out there okay it's temporary but th- that's all i need to do i'm still making something physical i'm causing a vi- a vibrations in air molecules and that's going over to your ears. I could be, um, uh, yeah, doing hand signals that you can see. They're temporary, but it's again, it's a physical thing. And with a different one of your senses, with eyesight, you're able to, the message is getting across into your brain somehow. I could be tapping on your chair in Morse code. And so with the sense of touch, you are then the message is then getting to your brain. All I'm trying to do is I am trying to, you know, the the thoughts in my head are actually structured. They're 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 forming a structure and there's an electrical network in my brain causing that thought to manifest. How it does in my brain, I'm wanting to cause the same network to grow in your brain and I'm passing along that message and I'm hoping that something approximating as closely as possible the thought let's call it that in my brain will then grow and manifest in your brain as well that's what I'm doing I'm passing along a message so that a network will then grow a map of meaning if you will will then come to your mind and hopefully we'll be able to share something and the possibilities then are tremendous um is this unique to humans well no animals communicate in all sorts of ways visually um through smell a lot better than we can very many of them um now the, the question is do they have the cognitive ability to perform the levels of abstraction that we can. We can imagine all sorts of things. We can imagine a circle. We can imagine all the different ideas that we're talking about in this show. We can imagine um, goodness, that concept. We can imagine all kinds of qualities of things. Um, we We can abstract to God, as Aristotle Indeed, did and you know the uh, of course you know ancient Greeks. Um, so you know our level of abstraction is you know ac- astronomically beyond what animals uh, seem to be able to do, um, and and that is what enables us to have the kinds of thoughts that are so complex that we need all of these very um, sophisticated forms of passing on a message to each other um, in order to then have those shared thoughts about those things. Um, Once again, I'm wondering if that makes sense. This is kind of ironic (laughs) because I'm talking about communicating ideas and sharing thoughts. Um, And on the other hand, I'm thinking, am I... uh, 
Am I oh, going yeah, off I already, on one here? I stated, uh, are these I boys stated, sharing the same thoughts in their heads as me? I stated in the beginning that it, it the, the the obvious retort to any of this kind of linguistics analysis is this sort of easy critic. You're using language. It's performative contradiction. That's the obvious maneuver anyone could do on the outside. And I somewhat agree at times with it, but it is the internal workings of it is mysterious here. So within, I think you might have a question but or a statement, but not to well, interrupt I was, there. I was thinking uh, what's interesting here with respect to language and animals, um, I was reminded of a um, uh, blog post by Ed Faser in which he quotes Karl Popper. Who, and Karl Popper distinguishes four functions of language, and I quote, the expressive function, which involves the outward expression of an inner state. The signal signaling function, which adds the adds to the description, sorry, adds to the expressive function, the generation of a reaction in others. The descriptive function, which involves a statement of a complete thought of a sort that might be expressed in the declarative sentence. And the argumentative function, which involves a statement of an inference from one thought to another. Uh, now, Faisa continues to say then, some non-human animals are capable of the first two functions, and in that sense might have might said to be have, have language, but the last two functions involve the grasp of concepts, and human beings alone possess the language of the sort that, which expresses concepts, thoughts, and arguments. So I was just wondering, uh, Tim and Rick, um, what would you think of Popper's distinction? Do you think Popper's distinction here holds and is an accurate description of uh, animal sort of communication, uh, but then sort of clearly distinguishes uh, human uh, communication and language, or do you think there's more to it uh, than Popper uh, gives off, uh, implies? I'll quick cut, cut near for a short comment. The the animal thing has always been mysterious to me because it's sort of like, you know, what does the cat think about you uh, letting him outside? Or what does the cat think about you doing this or that? Uh, so I have a few friends who have dog trainers, vets, things like that. And there was these, I don't know if you, anyone saw these dog button things, they have horses too. Uh, some of them make fun of them and say it's all nonsense. It's just the horse memorizing in a way, memorizing air quote, it's a concept of using a word. Uh, and she's pointing to that and you get something here. Uh, like, you know, you know like I want to go outside. So they push this button here. So uh, to what extent animals know things? I, I think, is an interesting related question here. Um, can animals talk? Uh, that's, you know, now for one thing, they might, they're probably not physically capable of it just based on their, uh, you know, their, their, their biological structures, you know, maybe parrots, but, you know, like uh, parrots just, it's a word, it's like a verb, you know, if you parrot something, it just repeats, you know, go to church or have, have a beer or something like that. But, is the parrot really talking? Eh, not really. Uh, it's it, you know, if if you ask a waiter, can I have a beer, please, and they bring you a beer, oh, that means they understood it. Um, and I think in our very first meetups with them, we were discussing words, funnily enough. Uh, uh, and I said, you know, if I could change the definition of coffee cup to chair and switch them. You know, that that the reality completely makes sense. So bring me a coffee. And it's actually a chair. Uh, 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 so, so do languages? Do animals know language? I, I have no idea here. I mean, I, I think they're more like children in this regard. Um, although I don't want to be careful here. What, Rick's ex explanation to me is always mysterious with with the, the Chomsky theory because Chomsky posits a theory, and we're either supposed to prove it or falsify it. And it's like, well, you know, if the theory is false, how exactly do we falsify it? False theory. Uh, I, I quick looked into it, and apparently there is a tribe, and I think in Brazil that they found that does not have the, the tense here. And that was actually a communist who wrote the quick article about it. So, so it's fairly politically correct too. So, um, um, so, so I think Chomsky himself said the theory is wrong. Although, although who knows? Uh, Rick, do you have any further comments about the relationship to animals here? I, I, I find the I find animals speaking to be rather dubious here. This is the thing. I it depends what you mean by speaking. Um, I says, you know, if you want to view language as being um, a sort of um, developing because of a communicational need, uh, which 
you know, any, any, or, you know, animal, any, you know, being or, you know, organic being might, you know, have in the world, um, you know, communicating certain things about your health and that sort of thing for mating purposes, um, you know, it, it, that would become a very good, what can I say, problem solving device. It's just the kinds of uh, problems that humans need to be able to solve are quite complex because of how adaptable we are. Um, you know, we, we, you know, we have these thumbs and you have, we have these large brains and physically our bodies are very vulnerable. And so we need to be able to create tools and um, um, just go about adapting to different environments. So, you know, the kinds of problems that we need to be able to solve, um, uh, you know, especially, you know, trying to um, convince other others to be involved in our projects and things like that um you know some tools and some um for instance you know a food a food stuff or wine or you know whatever it might be uh, would require a community in order to produce uh, and it may be a very good idea because that might be what gets you through winter so our problem solving needs are far more complex and therefore our communicational needs are, uh, are greater and therefore um, you know to be able to create more complex uh, symbols with with um, um, packaged meanings uh, may become greater and you know over distances you know something that is visual it, it, it's just very laborious to be constantly transferring visual symbols to each other you know kind of sign language all right you know i've got to put down whatever i'm doing I and mean, i've got to start waving my hands around at you um which is all very well you know if you're italian and you know, not up to much anyway and you can just be you know waving around to giuseppe over there and when you you know finish your break and when you get on with a bit of work but um you know um you know if, if we're all very busy and we're desperately trying to survive the winter over here and we've got a lot to get on with uh it, it may be a better idea if i just ah uh, you know i i just make a sound with my mouth over to you very quickly a bunch of bab and automatically you just understood everything that i i, I would like you to do um that's great that's so easy it, it's, it's not very expensive to me um and you know over time humans have developed this ability to just not even have to think about it it just becomes so proceduralized for most of us obviously there are exceptions with people who are mute um so, you know autistic people um who you know they're there is a, a big disconnect between, OK, I've kind of got the sound in my head. Now I need to make that with all the muscles of my tongue, my jaw, you know, all of that. That's terribly difficult. Um, but for, for us, you know, we seem to be doing it without thinking about it at all in this conversation. Um, and, and so, you know, that is what's developed over time. It's ability to just, you know, have a thought in one's head. And then. I can just make a few sounds of my mouth very easily or, you know, completely proceduralized. Um, I've had a lot of a uh, lot of practice with it throughout my childhood. Um, it's taken a long time. Uh, human childhood is a long old process, a very expensive one. But uh, now I can communicate all sorts of ideas and we can do all sorts of weird and wonderful things, um, you know, building skyscrapers and you know goodness knows what else you know rockets and um ice cream um all sorts of crazy stuff so would you say that uh, animals have thought in a relevant sense of having abstract concepts or would you say that similar to uh popper that they don't have that or would you say they did and there's no sort of categorical dis distinction there's just sort of a quantitative one it's, well, it's very difficult because you know, no animal has ever really told me, but, um, you know, uh, I can, you know, see a dog having dreams 
and then he'll wake up and sort of stumble over and think, oh, I'll have some water. And, and when he goes and has a drink of water and uh, hears something, and, th- and then he's clearly thinking, oh, what's that? Not saying those words in his head, but that's definitely a feeling that he seems to be having. Um, and likewise, I can look at a human and, oh, he's clearly having a dream and he wakes up and he's rubbing his eyes and he's sort of stumbling over. He's not quite woken up yet. The brain is clearly not fully active and he's sort of stumbled over to the sink and he's getting himself a glass of water and he's having a drink and then he might hear a noise and then oh, look out the window and he's clearly wondering, oh, what's that? Um, and I can... Uh, make a very good guess that that's what's going on in their brain because I have also had those thoughts if I can call them that they're more sort of impulses they're feelings which then lead to thoughts but as I said before you know in terms of greater abstraction um, of ideas um, to create all sorts of solutions for problems which may not even have arisen yet um, it doesn't seem that animals seem to be involved in that activity very much some some animals will some animals produce much so is is there so is there a fine is, is there a clear line between it or is it merely quantitative in your view, uh, I mean, do they have concepts, or do they not have concepts, or is that the wrong way of asking the question? Here, here's, it's, 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 would you say it's would you say it's like, you know, uh, a Ferrari is a much faster at driving than a, a person. Just to use that analogy here, um, but you know, this shows up in the sort of certain Aquinas God lecture talks here. Well, there's a quality difference. It's not just a faster car. It's a qualitatively yes. different thing. I yes. think that's the root of Swithin's question here. Is is there some like hard line between the two things? It's not just a faster runner or a taller person. Is that correct, Swithin? Is that like is that the essence yes. of your question? Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I mean, you do you do get humans who, for whatever reason, will have greatly reduced faculties and will seem to behave like you know we say like an animal. What children, do we mean? children what do we for mean example, in certain ways. They can, absolutely. Yes, they can. Um, you know, someone in a fit of rage, you know, it, it's very apparent. There are certain parts of their brain which have switched off and there are others which seem to be going mad. You know, they're, they're firing on all cylinders. Um, with, with animals, it, ju- it does seem to be that they are kind of, you know, they just, they're sort of led about by emotions you know stimuli prompting those emotions appetites that they're having from one moment to the next and uh, okay that you know they might have in their mind a concept of something a bird can make noises with its mouth to communicate about something to another bird but that other bird is not seen directly in front of it um now, you know, how much of that is simply the bird is acting on impulses, which are just automatically there. Um, it, it, it does seem that that is the case. But they, you do get some animals um, which, you know, seem to be making associations between things. And so, they, you know, it seems to be very, very limited abstraction, you know, very limited problem solving ability very little adaptability humans are able to make very broad connections between different things across different contexts and this is why we are so adaptable across different environments um and um you know that that ability you know then enables us to philosophize and we're able to think of you know eternal concepts you know we can think of a perfect circle has any of us ever seen a perfect circle no but we're able to abstract that from circular things that we have seen we're able to then you know perceive that that form um and we're able to you know perceive those those um 
you know, eternal forms, I, you know, which, you know, things in the world just seem to be conforming to, you know, we're able to see patterns um, at a level and across contexts, uh, which animals uh, do not seem to be able to do unless they have, um, um, you know, adapted to it in some way. So I do agree that language is useful and language is probably the thing in which humans have that makes humans somewhat unique and successful here. Uh, uh, and the, you know, the, and, and you have more complicated languages. Um, and so a while back, Swith and I did a interesting episode here on is Kim Jong Un right? Uh, Kim Jong Un right about math? Uh, and you know, the the joke was that uh, Kim Jong Un uh, was two plus two. He said it was actually two clouds plus two clouds equals one giant cloud, not just uh, uh, one, uh, not just four clouds or something like that. So I do agree, language is useful to communicate, and communication begets action, and you can build things and do do complicated tasks here. But other than that, you know, which goes back to my first example with the six sentences here, you can basically convey the meaning to me. You brought up the example about autism here. Like you can basically convey the meaning with all six sentences here. Uh, uh, so you know, to me, they're all they're all equally correct uh, <laughs> in my head here, which is one of the, my uh, bugaboos here with grammar. So I, to me, it's more like architectural style, uh, where well, some buildings look better than other buildings. So that's 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 the way of actually. And this is the the use function of this episode to me is somewhat to improve my writing. And the best way for me to improve my writing is probably think about, you know, what counts as good writing, you know, because the the well, oh, you, it sounds, you know, the idea, well, it sounds better. Well, to me, it sounds perfectly fine to say any of the six ways, especially if I say it enough. If I say actually the more times I say it, I can argue myself into that position here uh, uh, that it is the correct way. Um, and, you know. You brought up the infringes on your libertarian example. You know, let's say I started to let's say I happen to have a big corporation. Let's say I bought a million bitcoins ten years ago. I could just, you know, print a bunch of dictionaries. I could make a new. I could, you know, I as an individual, if I have enough influence, can actually change language in a contrary way as well. You know, given you brought up the example of Shakespeare, the King James Bible. There's certain words that, you know, were quote unquote invented. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't deny that language is useful. I think I do think it's a demarcation point between humans and animals. Uh, but but it, it's it's a very flaky topic here talking about it. Uh, it that's that's one of the irritations of it. And it's in, in order to talk, you have to use language. So it is it is it is rather ironic here having a conversation about having. The, the mechanisms of which we have conversations here. Um, so, so I do find it interesting here, and that's my use function here. You know, if you want to improve as a writer, uh, you have to sort of become more intelligible to other people. So that that's why I'm doing it. Uh, uh, that that's why I'm doing. It. But I do I do think logically all six of those sentences make sense. I just don't know what's the difference here. So that's my real final statement here. Swithin, do you have anything else to add? I mean, I enjoyed doing this this conversation. Or if Rick wants to add, I know Rick has to go, but that's my response here. Um, I would say, um, that I would reiterate what, what Rick said at the, the beginning, that it's sort of sort of musical, although I would part compare, I may have misinterpreted Rick's statements, but um, there does seem to be a um, categorical difference between the style of language used by humans um, than, and that relative to animals. Um, abstraction and having content, um, concepts and specific concepts of things is something that humans have. Now, obviously, some humans don't have it. Doesn't mean that it's not natural to humans in the same way to say that humans don't have legs because some humans don't have it um so um i would distinguish it uh there so i i, I do think popper's uh distinction is 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 quite an interesting and useful one here 
Um, I'd like to thank, thank Rick for joining us and for everyone for listening. If you've enjoyed this, please share it with your friends and family. And if you would like to contact the show for any reason, please contact us at mindcrimelibertyshow at gmail.com. That's mindcrimelibertyshow at gmail.com. Mm-hmm.